I got a great panel here, three great cities that I've visited many times and loved dearly. I've got the, the city managers from Halifax, Kathy O'Toole, from Toronto, my old hometown, uh, Paul Johnson, formerly from Hamilton as well, which was sort of a second hometown before Ottawa became my main of residence. And then last but not least, Andre Corbeau from Edmonton. Tell us about a place-based example from your experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be from your jurisdiction, but from your lived experience where you felt made a difference and potentially made a difference, not just locally, but nationally. Kathy, you want to kick us off? Sure. And uh, there's a few place-based, I think, examples that Halifax could choose. I'm going to pick one that I was intimately involved with, and that was creation of Canada's first regional water, wastewater, and stormwater utility. And, uh, you know, the success associated with that is that Halifax Water is now an internationally recognized utility. But the benefit is that it's taken a regional approach to building critical infrastructure, took a lot of burden off the municipal tax rate, and has enabled us to move forward in a way that if it hadn't occurred, you know, would never have happened and it was because of collaboration. Excellent, I come back to that concept of collaboration and how much that is a priority in these successful projects. Paul, over to you. So hands down for me, uh, you know, 2004, a real step forward in the province of Ontario and in the community I was in in Hamilton around early child development, and that was the start of the Best Start initiative in Ontario. It brought together people under the premise that we were going to look at how you could have community-based centers of excellence and providing service for early child development, how they would be strongly linked to schools, which are so critical from a place-based perspective, but follow under a, a framework and a pedagogy that would be driven uh, provincially and really become another tier as important as elementary and secondary education. Uh, for children pre, uh, uh, prenatally to age six and their caregivers. And why it was important is it was an initiative that funded, first of all, collaboration, which we never see. <laughs> we're asked to collaborate and we're asked to find the resources to collaborate. And it funded collaboration amongst community providers, amongst educators, amongst healthcare providers. It encouraged communities to reach out across each other, sometimes done in an exercise of making sure there was consistency and making sure that we were being the most effective in the way we provided early child uh, services, but also to learn about the differences in rural, in urban, and suburban areas. And it funded capacity building. And I know in Hamilton, our Indigenous child care and Head Start provider programs would not have been able to expand to where they are today had they not had that investment. And I use it as an example because as we talk about the challenges we're facing now, required reading should be the work of the late Dr. Fraser Mustard, Clyde Hertzman, James Heckman, around the importance of investment in the early years because the links around the early years in brain development to mental health issues and physical health issues later in life is not a discussion point, it's based in science. And so as we continue to deal with the present day, what we're dealing with, we need to consider uh, also how we're investing in our newest and youngest uh, residents in our communities. Excellent, Paul, well, thanks so much. We've got a strong sense of collaboration, the first two. Not that you need to follow in behind that, Andre, but I'm interested uh, what you've experienced. You've had a remarkable career, Armed Forces, uh, Deputy Minister, City Manager. Where are you going to pull from? Yeah, well, I'm going to pull from the recent one on, on community safety and well-being. We were uncoordinated and uncollaborative uh, uh, at, after what I thought was a height of uh, tension on community safety after George, George Floyd was murdered and the, the pandemic and all the other things that happened around that time. We had to get organized and we did it and, and we created a uh, community driven, community led community uh, safety and well being strategy. It's a seven pillar strategy that leads with anti racism and truth and reconciliation. And why it was so successful is it, it was community based, community involved, and everybody has 
Uh, lots of stuff to work out in the details, but everybody agrees with the seven pillars that we have and what we've set out on. And the architecture, the architect of that strategy is Salima Ibrahim. She's our city chief of staff. She's here if you want to get it. Uh, but what was great and successful is we put resources to the strategy and everybody has a map now where to go. And everybody knows in Edmonton, if you want to work on this, and you, you, it's got to be one of the pillars, we'll fund it, we'll help you, we'll support you, and everybody works together on it. So. Outstanding. Salima, can you just put your hand up or, or stand up? There she is. Outstanding work out in Edmonton. I've been on the ground to see it. Fantastic. Um, where do you look for inspiration? Andre, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll, we'll work back to the East Coast. Is there a city? Is there a region? Is there a country? Uh, is there an industry sector where you're seeing, as you describe those elements, but on scale, consistently done well? Where do you look for inspiration? Actually, I take my inspiration from uh, my uh, career in the armed forces. I spent 28 years uh, doing mostly country building in in conflict or post-conflict nations around the world, including Afghanistan and Bosnia and Iraq and Kuwait and all these places. Um, and the, the reason I take inspiration is the amazing people I worked with in all those countries and, and more recently three tours in Afghanistan to see the resilience and the agility of people when things are really, really bad. We have it really, really good in Edmonton and Canada, despite all of our challenges. We have it really, really good. And uh, I think we need to be inspired by people who don't have the same opportunities and luxuries and, op and lives we have. And I think we owe it to many of them and many of them who become Canadian uh, as newcom newcomers to be inspired by what they can overcome and what they can do. And that's what I look to all the time. And, you know, the best things that happened in my time in Afghanistan was when the president, the governor of the province, and the mayor got in a room, agreed, collaborated, and got things done. That's when good things happen. And I wish we would see that more here. That's great. Um, there was no throat punching involved in that one, was there? No. no just uh, just no. channeling my inner mayor and In fact, lots of tea drinking. Yeah. Um, uh, my two tours of duty in Kosovo, that showed me the, the same sort of inspiration. I appreciate that very much. Paul, what, uh, what gets you excited in the morning before going into your 12-hour day? <laughs> you know, I, I gather inspiration from everybody I come across in, in the city of Toronto as you get out and talk to people about the work that they're doing. And that sounds a bit cliche, uh, but it's true. It's through those conversations that in the pandemic, we were able to create the types of community networks and ambassador programs that ensured we were able to penetrate from a vaccine perspective into communities that were deeply um, affected in the past with institutional responses and needed though to be brought into that. That's translated itself into things like our Toronto Community Crisis ser Service, which is, you know, now going to roll out across the entire city of Toronto. It is a true diversion program through 311-211 as well as 911. And it is demonstrating that by listening to people who do this work each and every day, we can then get together and figure out, well, how will we systemically fix this? One of the things coming out of the pandemic is to say, well, that ambassador program in Toronto, and many communities had it about how we, we improved vaccination rates among certain populations. How do we do that across a community health perspective? Why would we shut that down now that the crisis part of the pandemic is over? Why wouldn't we build on that and actually see how we can deal with some of the other social determinants of health? And so those conversations that often come out of a challenge, uh, they can come out of, uh, you know, really difficult circumstances. Toronto's had to have conversations about how the interactions, particularly around mental health, do not take place exclusively with the members of the Toronto Police Service. But the way we've been able to frame that conversation to not be about us versus them, but to be about the better way that we serve Torontonians is actually what inspires me most. It's pretty easy to say, well, we'll set up an alternative that's about you not doing it right and us doing it right. And the answer to that is we'll both fail. It is that combined effort to make sure that we serve our communities well. And so that inspiration is, is what drives me each and every day. And it actually is what's driving better place-based uh, results across our country. Excellent, Paul, thanks. Kathy? My answer is a little bit similar. My inspiration is the public servants, the community volunteers, and some of the business leaders that I interact with every day. And seeing how, in times of great crisis, they mobilize and work together. 
whether it was how we responded to COVID-19 or this year in particular, Halifax has had a challenge. We've had uh, the worst wildfire the province has ever seen, the largest mass evacuation that's ever been done. And we've had uh, floods, we've had a hurricane and seeing how people uh, pull together and collaborate in the face of those challenges. We have a community that is becoming increasingly a tight-knit collaborative network. And, you know, for instance, the head of our chair Chamber of Commerce is here today. The head of some of our business improvement districts are here today. That's because they care so deeply about the success of the city. And, you know, a big, you know, shout out that they care enough to come here and participate in these events. Excellent. Um, I'm going to see if Mary's got any questions from the floor, but just as she's coming up, I usually don't do an or question, but I'm going to deliberately do one. We heard a lot of discussion in the panels earlier on about funding, 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 and where it's coming from. Um, so deliberately challenging you. If you had a choice between more money and better partnerships in order to produce sustainable, meaningful success in place-based approaches, which would you choose? More money or better partnerships, better collaboration? Let's start here with Andre and then we'll work back east. I think for me it's partnerships. Um, and, and we see this uh, in some of the programs we've run. It's that lack of coordination. The, the more co coordinated we are, the better we can use the, the funds that you know all the taxpayers provide at all levels of government. So for me it's partnerships, hands down. Paul? Yeah, I agree. Uh, if we can get the structures right and we can get those partnerships right, we won't have to worry as much about uh, fighting for the money. And the other thing I'll say right now, it is really hard. If someone wants to actually say, so what's the dollar figure in the city of Toronto to solve X issue or Y issue? I don't know that I'd be able to say it. Why? Because I have no idea all of the component parts that would need to be part of ultimately a resourcing solution for that. So if it really was a money first issue, we would have that answer. And I know sometimes the answer is we do need more, and I would agree with that. But until we get our, we spend a bit more time on that structural partnership, who does what exercise, uh, it will always be the, well, we could use a bit more, we need a bit more. Uh, and and I, I think if we go back to the other way, we'll actually get a better answer. Kathy, you got a CPA background, so I know money's important, but you did talk about collaboration. Which way are you going to go on this one? Well, this is hard because I think Halifax gets less transfers from other levels of government than any other city in Canada. We work in a very unique environment, and we're, we're used to doing less with more, and we're innovative in terms of you know finding ways to finance our own challenges, and we've got a lot of smart accountants. So I'm not going to say money. I'm going to say partnerships. And I think that, uh, you know, partnerships, but finding the right partners is critical. People who are going to come into a room and leave their ego at the door and leave their political background or aspirations at the door to some extent and be solutions oriented and objective and fair. Now, can I just cut in here on behalf of the three of us and please say that if any of you go back and tell our councils that we said we didn't need any more money, <laughs> we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So don't worry, it's been live uh, streamed. You're partnerships okay. are important, but <laughs> all right, outstanding, Audrey. Thank you, Mary. Anything so from? well, it's interesting. The questions from the floor kind of weave into where you were just going, Peter. Um, uh, a comment generally about a concern about how we have a narrative in Canada where cities whine a lot about not having enough money. And is that getting old? That's a question that came from the floor. But here's a related question. And this is where we want all the social media people to stand down. Let's just, tr I know we're online, but let's just try to have a, see how, how, whether these guys are gonna deal. What do you do when your mayor and your councils are doing something dumb? <laughs> Boy, am and I ever glad know, I'm not And you know what the right thing to do is. What do you do? Well, who wants to wade into those waters first? <laughs> I'll take that one. Go. If anybody who knows my background, you'll know I've been around for, I don't know, about 25 years. I was with the city for 10 years, then went over to the utility for 11 years, and now I'm back at the city as the CSO, the CAO. The first time I encountered that situation, you know, I made a principal decision to escalate an issue and withdraw you know, and, and, and take a career change just because I didn't, didn't want to uh, 
work with an organization with leadership that didn't align with my personal values. So I think uh, CAOs have an obligation to put their best professional advice towards uh, council, needs to reflect the, and respect the decisions that council makes and support it. But at the end of the day, as professionals, you know, we also have to live to our own values and demonstrate that. Thank you, Kathy. Anybody else? Andre, I think you. Yeah, I, I, I guess the f I would agree with Kathy if you have to get there. I, what I try to do first is seek to understand because I think the first thing to understand is if they're doing something that you don't think is wise, and I'll put it that way, uh, Mary, uh, you know, remember who they're representing. Maybe they're getting told by a lot of the people that elected them to do something in, the, in, a, separate, in, a, in a way. So I do think we have to seek to understand. Um, I, I also think... Uh, how I've gotten through some of those circumstances is just presenting data. Maybe there was a, maybe we didn't, had not presented the right data in a way that they didn't understand. And so, but yeah, ultimately, if you get to the, the point where Kathy ex expressed, you might have to get there. But um, yeah, I mean, seek to understand and try to help them with information. So, thanks, Andre. Paul? Uh, I just tell them to halt. Are you hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? Because that's probably why you're headed in this direction. <laughs> And then we can get some uh, good data in your hands and we can start to talk about the right way to go. I mean, that's a, a little bit of a, a fun answer, but I think the realities are I, I, I haven't really experienced in two municipalities where really, I mean, they may seem dumb to individuals. And I think we have to be careful sometimes that we don't always project an individual piece. Now, I'm not talking about the times where it gets right up against integrity, it gets right up against personal values and all that, but generally speaking, you know, I, I, the question to the first panel was excellent. What do we do really well? I mean, Canadians are well governed. We're actually seen around the world as a really stable place of government. And I actually think that by and large, the decisions made, although sometimes they may skew a little bit towards what's happening in the local newspaper and the headlines, they usually tend to come back to what is a balanced approach. It may not be the way Paul Johnson would have said it. And maybe we can provide as, as the public service some advice to get people to where they need to go. Um, but it, in those real moments of where things are drifting into to what I call never, never land, it's halt. Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired? And they usually answer yes to three or four of them. I say, well, maybe we should carry this on to the next council and have the discussion then. <laughs> I, I think this group is verging into the hungry, lonely, tired yeah. category themselves. Uh, but I think where this was coming from was um, some folks say, asking are we taking enough responsibility at the local level for bad decisions? So sprawl is, I think, what people are getting at, that municipal governments have over time, and municipal councils over time have been influenced by NIMBY. They've not intensified their neighborhoods. They, they need the tax base, and so they continue to annex and create, and now you're reaping the benefits. So I think that's the illustration of where council decision-making may have been at odds at what your staff may have felt was the right thing to do. Kathy's just nodding at me. <laughs> well, those I things happen, and then you see communities stepping forward and changing that. And so right. if you look at what's happening policy-wise across many cities, um, and not all cities are the same, but in cities where it makes sense to, to make changes, there are things occurring. So I can talk about, you know, my own community in Toronto now. The policy changes on housing that are happening in the city of Toronto are things that people have said, you know, it's always the, this will never happen in Toronto. We'll never see the day. Well, the never day has come. I don't ever agree with never. But there are people saying, wow, we have moved the needle on policy, and, and it's because we have to. And so then there is that connection point. And that's where the public service, for all those years where it may have been, boy, I'm not sure about this. Are we ready? Are we ready with the way to quickly move into the space when it's opened? And what I speak to our folks about quite often in Toronto is be ready. What if they say yes? <laughs> and when they say yes, are we ready with here's how we can get you strategically, professionally, and in a coordinated way to where you need to go? Because if not, then the nervousness will set in and we can have reversal of some of those decisions. And we've seen some of that happen on occasion, I'm sure all three of us. Yeah, and I would say you know, we're here to talk about unraveling the Gordian knot. What, what I get sick and tired about, Mary, is people whining about the Gordian knot. Like, we gotta get to unraveling it, deal with it. And, uh, and so I don't like the whining, 
uh, from any order of government, including the municipal government. We just got to get doing things. And I think we can. I mean, we are very proud in Edmonton of having just approved our zoning bylaw renewal, which will come into effect in January. Uh, we had already gotten rid of like parking minimums and stuff a long time ago, and we're moving to the next level. We are decomplicating that. Uh, that space and the zoning bylaw renewal is a great example of unraveling the Gordian knot. That's what we're doing. So we've got to stop whining and just get on with fixing the problems. When, when um, Mary asked me to do this session, she gave me the title and I saw a Gordian knot. I had to remind myself it wasn't unraveled, it was just chopped by a great big sword. Um, that isn't an option in the toolkit of, of city managers. So um, put on your hometown hat, um, not Hamilton, Toronto hometown hat. Uh, walk us through a space that isn't in the headlines, that, that you embrace, that your community embraces, that is something magical and local, but is having a radiating impact. Um, beyond the examples you've talked before, just picture that space and describe it to us in a couple of minutes each, and help us to fall into that space and then be inspired by that to create the spaces that we represent from across this room. I can start with uh, our river valley. We have the nicest river valley in the world, I think, in terms of park space. We just bought another, I don't know, 180 hectares of, of park. We are building out that space in the beautiful city of Edmonton, and it's going really well, and uh, it's a great success, and that is our most treasured resource that we always uh, invest in, and people love it. So, yeah, great. Thank you for that. Paul or Kathy? Uh, for me, it's the work that's happening in neighborhoods and, you know, not unique to Toronto, but a lot of communities have embraced a, a neighborhood level work. And if you see some of the things that do bubble up to the headline level at the city of Toronto, they've started in neighborhoods. And I can trace some of the things now as I learn more about the roots of some of these really incredible things that are going on, including, you know, one I've mentioned, our crisis uh, community service. It's traced to neighborhood work that was trying to do some things a little bit differently. Uh, when I think about ways that communities are dealing with violence um, across the city of Toronto, you can trace it to community leadership that happens at that neighborhood level. And so below the surface of the big policy decisions and the big strategic initiatives that, that we push forward, it's these wonderful examples of how people are coming together at that neighborhood level. And I think as we look at housing from its complete continuum, not talking about it at the high level of programs and huge amounts of funding, but when we actually get to the delivery level, that's where it's happening. And one of the most exciting things I've seen is our partnership with UHN. Um, you know, Chris Murray, our former city manager, is here, and he really structured these conversations that said it is about health, it's about the city, it's about the community coming together to provide things like housing, and then all the supports that make housing a home so we can actually get onto it. And that's happening at the local level, not at, uh, at, at some boardroom level. One of the spaces that... I find um, is inspirational and giving me hope is the work being done on climate change adaptation and mitigation in Halifax. You know, there was a, a Halifax 2050 plan approved uh, three years ago. There has been a climate action tax put in place within the municipality to fund it. And most recently this year, CEOs of some of the major organizations within the municipality came together to sign a climate action charter. So I think there's a real momentum on climate that's beginning to happen in Halifax. That is exciting. Excellent. We're three minutes between a room full and a wonderful buffet table over there. Mary, anything else from the floor? I've got one more question lined up, but anything else from the floor? No, please. I'm getting to the point where I can recognize your handwriting, those of you that are sending and repeating. <laughs> Just saying. Um, a question about data. Um, are we using data as effectively as we could be in terms of influencing our own municipal policies, but also working with partners of the province and the feds? Do we have the tools we need data-wise? No. <laughs> okay. No, but yeah, I would agree. We don't have all the tools uh, data-wise we need, but we're working on it. But why it's more most important, Mary, I think is, you know, we were having a huge dispute with our province about shelter space. And, and once we started chasing after the data, 
and we demonstrated the data, we got exactly on the same page with our province on shelter space. And so that has been a monumental shift in terms of collaborating between City of Edmonton and the province of Alberta. We are on the same page. We are working uh, together now on the same outcomes. And the only way we got there is from data. So that's why it's so important. I would agree with no, but the uh, tools and the systems exist. It's the data sharing arrangements that I think don't exist. And I'll just echo, you know, uh, Andre's comments. If you think about what happened this week in Toronto and, and um, a new structured relationship with the province of Ontario, that all came about because of a lot of work on building data. So we don't have them readily at hand. It took Toronto about a year to produce what was a, a suite of information and data that allowed us not to have a philosophical or ideological conversation about how we might have a new relationship with the province of Ontario, but one that actually got at some of the unique challenges that, um, that Toronto faces. And so when we can get it right, it really works. The problem is we don't have enough of those things at our fingertips where we can use it quickly. I'm going to just pull a thread between all of you. Dale McPhee was uh, the Prince Albert Chief of Police back in 2012 came to Toronto to give a presentation on integrated human services that required data sharing and had to get over the privacy legislation hump. Most people didn't understand the privacy legislation, so we assumed we couldn't do it. But when Dr. Kavukian came in and said, no, you can actually do this with some risk mitigation, the information flowed, the partnerships grew, the trust came into place, the pilot projects worked, and we could scale things from Prince Albert to Edmonton um, certainly, SafeTO runs on a data now, a data sharing platform with the federal government that has opened up new data sources for them, and they're knocking it out of the park in terms of an alternate to police service delivery. I'm less familiar with Halifax, but just hearing the passion and compassion in your voice, Kathy, tells me that great things are happening out there. The data will flow because you've got the right people with the right heart. People matter. Places matter. Partnerships maybe matter the most in this day and age. I want to thank CUI again for having us up here, and I hope this was a valuable session. Lunch is served. <laughs>